thank you for your mercy, O oh God, your great love for us. I commend this time back into your hands. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. Things happen to the believer for a reason. God has decided it. We're not in control of it. We can beseech him, but his answer is his answers. Our circumstances and happenstance in our lives are actually designed by an engineer who is God. So nothing happens to us unless God has allowed it. Thank God is for his good purpose. In Romans 8, verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. All things work together. That's a hard thing for us to accept, that all things work together for good. But the criteria that gives us hope is that we love God and we know that we are called. In Hebrews 11, verse 33 through 34, who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions. So the trials and tribulations that these saints were in were real things that had real impact on their lives. And they suffered uh, in order to get a revelation of how great and how strong and how forthwith uh, the faith of God and having faith in God is. Continue. Quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong. Out of weakness was made strong. So these trials, these tribulations, these things that happen upon us have a divine purpose. And, and one of the purposes is, is that this weakness, whatever it is that we happen to have in our life, uh, will be made strong. Became valiant in battle, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. So you get the picture, the idea that these things that happen to the believer, and to that extent, you are or have to be a believer to hang tough, to stay in there, uh, to be convinced that at the end, God will work this all together for good. And that's our hope. And it's a living hope where people that don't believe um, they um, may go into mental, uh, physical, spiritual depression of some kind or another. In um, Acts chapter 28, through, uh, 26 through 27. Saying, go to this people and say, hearing you will hear and shall not understand. In seeing, you will see and not perceive. For the hearts of this people have grown dull. Their ears are hard of hearing, and their eyes they have closed. Lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears. Lest they should understand with understand their hearts. Understand or be converted. Understand or be converted. Their hearts will be converted and turn so that I should heal them. So in the midst of these things that are happening to the believer, the desire of God is that our eyes will be open, our ears could hear, and that we would have an understanding that we will return to him and be converted. In Luke chapter 22, starting with verse 28. But you are those who have continued with me in my And so trials. this is Jesus talking to his disciples, his people. Continue. And I bestow upon you a kingdom, just as my father bestowed one upon me, that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, and sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. So he's making this glorious declaration to them, if you will. And, uh, but he's getting ready to hit Peter in particular with a bombshell. But, I mean, and I'm sure they're, they're listening with rapt attention because, of course, he's saying good stuff to them. Continue. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed, Satan has Now, this asked is in the midst of this declaration of glory. He says, he turns to Simon and, and says, Simon, Simon, indeed, Satan has what? Asked for you. I mean, that's not 
an invitation, obviously, no one wants to get and certainly not answer that Satan has asked for you. Continue. That he may sift you as wheat. That he might sift you as wheat. Continue. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. Here it is. He's in the midst of telling them things that are too glorious for us to even understand. And then he turns to Peter and says to him, Satan wants you. That is the, the test that every believer has to go through. They have to face the enemy. The enemy has to test you because all of these Bible studies and lessons is all to a future date and maybe even a present date today in some people's lives where they have to face the tester. I mean, that's not something we as Christians look forward to because we talk a good game. But the reality is there is an apprehension, there is a fear that the enemy will come at some point. And it could be a little test. It doesn't have to be a ginormous test, but it's a test nonetheless. And it might be a test, and that's the only test you get. For example, with Job, you know, the scripture doesn't say of any test that he got after that ordeal. Uh, or it might be a small test, or it might be a series of tests. But at some point, the enemy will challenge us. You know, we went on vacation uh, this week, my whole family. And, uh, of course, you're planning to, for this thing for weeks on end and those kinds of things. And you want everything to be perfect. But you, we don't live in a perfect world. And if we happen to have a perfect uh, vacation, you better get on your knees quickly and thank God. But uh, because things happen, uh, 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 and there's a reason why things happen, at least for the believer. But in any event, we go down there in the, in the second, and everything's, well, everything wasn't fine even going down there. We had one family that the, the children got sick, and, you know, when that happens, that's just like a, you, everything comes to a full streaking halt. And so someone, I mean, a family got sick and um, there was in-house fighting. Here we are going on vacation, but you already know the fight is on about whatever, different things that go on in families. So anyway, we get down there. And the second morning of that, early in the morning, we receive a phone call that we had an incident uh, at the house and we're six hours away and so what to do and so thank God uh, we called um, this particular couple that's been with us uh, for over 30 something years over 35 years I think and um, uh, thank God their phone was on number one so anyway they had to come down to the house they live in the neighborhood and uh, they came down to the house and uh, they had to make sure that everything was okay until they as, as much as they could and that went on for hours uh, because of the nature of the incident. And, uh, and so, so what to do, whether you come home, whether you, I mean, because it was serious, whether you come home, whether you don't. And so we commended it. We prayed and commended it over to the Lord. We felt that, um, uh, that it would be okay until we got back home. And then we had to have someone house sit uh, for those days because of the nature of the incident that happened. And, you know, you're saying, why is this happening? You <laughs> know, it is. Uh, we're, we're going on vacation. We're at vacation. This thing is going on. That thing is going on. And the other thing is going on. But things do happen to the believer, and there's reasons for it. And already uh, we're seeing that there was reasons for what happened. But this, there's a sifting process that take place that would happen in Peter's life and would happen, and it happens in our lives as well. And the sifting process or this threshing, uh, God will allow the enemy, Satan, to try us. God uses the process to expose our weaknesses, our pride, self-righteousness, our anger, hurt, disappointment, deception, hypocrisy, lawlessness, hatred, lust. You get it. So these things, the sifting, 
where God allows, if you will, sifting is like um, uh, uh, the wind blows and it separates uh, something that's edible in the natural from something that's not edible. Uh, same thing happens spiritually. Uh, God allows the winds of storms to happen in our life to separate the thing that does not belong there. And he keeps the things that does. And so this process of sifting is so that these things can be examined by the light of truth. So things that happen in our life, whether they major or minor, is for purpose. It's because God is in control and we are not. And it's hard for us to wrap our minds around that fact because as believers, obviously, we figure we're saved, we're so-called doing the right thing. Why would God allow uh, mishap or even tragedy that happens in our lives? We want to say, God, that's not fair. That's for them. And it's not for us. So going back to, um, let's go to Psalms 51. So David, uh, when he um, fell into sin with Bathsheba, God allowed a sifting process to take place in his life. Even though this man had a heart after God's heart, you would think God wouldn't allow anything, if you will, bad to happen in his life. God would cover it up. God would make it go away. No, God actually brought the test and the tester to him. In Psalms 51, starting with verse 1 through 6. To the chief musician, a psalm of David, when Nathan the prophet went to him, after he had gone in to Bathsheba. Have mercy upon me, O God. So his response to the sifting, to this test, to this threshing, when he had come through it, and you would think a man like David would be aware of what he was going to do that was against God and himself. But it happened because that's the deception that we have on the inside of us. That when the, when the enemy comes, when Satan comes, when the tester comes, when the trial comes, this kind of stuff gets exposed. Continue. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness. According to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned, and done this evil in your sight, that you may be found just when you That you, you might be found just when you say, All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There is none right, none, no, not one. Continue. And blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in my sin, and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part you will make me to know wisdom. You desire truth. This light that comes from truth has to be in the inward parts in order for us to be in the kind of relationship where. All of this is working together for good for those that love God and are called according to his purpose. And as I said, this purpose of sifting wheat or any grain in the natural is to release the inedible chaff from the edible. In Matthew, in Matthew chapter 3, verse 11 through 12. I indeed baptize you with water unto re repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. And um, verse 13, I'm sorry, Matthew 13, verse 24 to 30. Another parable he put forth to them, saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But, the, but when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. So the servants of the owner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? He said to them, An enemy has done this. 
The servant said to him, Do you want us to then to go and gather them up? But he said, No, lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest, and at the time of harvest I will say to the reapers, First gather together the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. There's a difference. Even though they look alike, there is such a difference between a wheat and a tear. And God knows, and people around you will come to know exactly what you are, whether you are wheat or tear. And back to Luke 22. So this whole thing with Satan asking, Luke 22, verse 31, uh, asking for Peter. I'm sure Peter didn't know how to react to that, didn't know what to say. But he said something in verse 33, but he said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. He had no clue, none at all, what was about to happen to him. But Jesus was trying to warn him. He said, Satan has asked for you. It's your time. It's your place. It's your destiny to go through the things that you have gone through in your life and that you will go through in your life. It's the same with me. And the Lord says he's asked for you. And God is the one that gives Satan permission to test us. And I don't like saying this. I don't even want to say it. But it's true that you're asked for. First Peter chapter 5, verse 8 through 10. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him, steadfast in the faith. He's seeking who he may devour. That's his job. <laughs> To seek the ones, the tares, they eat them up if he can get a hold of them. But he's also more precious than tares, obviously, is wheat. And so we have to be vigilant, knowing that when something happens, to examine it, to see where it's coming from. Why is this happening? We may be able to find out the answer immediately, we may not. But it's always in the back of, my in back of my mind because God is a God of order. And I know nothing can happen for my life and those that attach to me unless God is going to bring forth good. I know this because if you don't know this, you're going to raise the fists. It can't be help. It's in us. Or we will hide the fists. And then at some point, it will come out and we will raise it to God and say, how dare you? I am good. I was righteous. I thought that was for them people because he makes his sun shine on the just, the unjust. And he makes it rain on the good and the evil alike. And we don't like that because we only think it should rain over there. It certainly should rain with people who are serving God, people who love God. And the reason why uh, there may be uh, the reason why something is happening, because God wants to ring home to us that this is a temporary place and this is a fallen world. And we don't, we don't like that because we think, because we have salvation, that we, we, we live in two places. We live up there and we also live down here. And the things that happens to other people happens to us as well. But there is a good reason when we believe God and are called according to his purpose. And we, we are not uh, in control of who we are born to. Whether we're born rich or poor, black or white, high or low, woman or man, all of those things that impact us in our lives, sometimes for evil, we're not in control of that because God is able to make a poor man rich and take a rich man and make him poor and because he's in control of that. So uh, the, the enemy is sent to test the work in our lives. In Revelation 12, 10, he is the accuser of the brethren night and day. He does, he's not accusing us 
with no evidence. <laughs> you know, we would like to think that. <laughs> But the Bible said the prince of this world cometh about Jesus and he has nothing in me. So he had nothing on Jesus. But we have a list of stuff that is true that he's accusing us before the father. Continue. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day, day and, night. and night. He's accusing us of stuff that we are not doing according to the will of God. He's accusing us and bringing to God our disobedience, bringing of our, our hatreds and our lust and all of this stuff that we have on, on sometimes is dormant, but uh, give it a, a situation, it becomes um, really powerful quickly, the stuff that's on the inside of us. But he's accusing uh, God with something, that's my point, that he's not just, you know, winging it, you know. I mean, what he's saying uh, to God about us is true. Uh, Job chapter 2, verse 4 and 6. So Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, yes, all that a man has he will give for his life. But stretch out your hand now, and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will surely curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, he is in your hand. So and he's in your life. hands. He's going to curse you. Watch. You go about protecting him, loving on him, providing for him, answering this prayer, and a little bit of something, something happens. You watch God. Watch the way he responds to you. Watch the way he treats you. Watch how you are not his priority at all. Even though you've done all this stuff for him, God. That's the kind of stuff he's saying, which is true. 1 Corinthians 5, verse 1 through 5. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and such sexual immorality as is not even named among the Gentiles that a man has his father's wife. It's not even named among the Gentile. You people are supposed to be believers. This is not even named among the Gentile who don't have the law. Continue. And you are puffed up and have not rather mourned that he who has done this deed might be taken away from among you. For I indeed, as absent in body, but present in spirit, have already judged as though I were present him who has so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together along with my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the so flesh. So people are horrified. But God had a good purpose because he's a tester. So you, And that was, if you will, our original master <laughs> said, turn him over to him. And if he doesn't shake the hell out of you, if you will, then nobody can, okay? If he doesn't get you to rethink the position of leaving God, maybe nobody can. But I'm going to turn you over to somebody who is quite the expert of convincing you maybe this is not the place. This is not the sin. This is not the decision you want to make. You might need to think about this. But in 2 Corinthians 2, verse 7 to 11, this man is restored. So that, on the contrary, you ought rather to forgive and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one be swallowed up with too much sorrow. Therefore I urge you to reaffirm your love to him. For to this end I also wrote, that I might put you to the test, whether you are obedient in all things. So everybody's being tested with this. So he comes back. Because you know what he decided? I, 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 it was better for me. Just like the particle. It was better for me in my father's house. So Satan serves, if you will, the purpose of God. And if we are under attack or being examined or being confronted or insulted by the enemy, is for the purpose of bringing us back to God. It's for the purpose of conversion, of converting and saying to ourselves, it was better for me in my father's house. And so he told him in Luke 22, verse 31 again, that he was going to sift him like wheat. 
He was going to bring him through the sieve. And you know, when you're sifting something, this tiny, tiny little holes, the, that the good stuff, if you will, comes through and the bad stays on top and is thrown out like the chaff is when you sift, sifting something in the nat natural. Sifting is always done to show us the truth and to bring us to remorse followed by our repentance. It's always meant for the believer. When we're going through something, even when the enemy, Satan, is the tester, it is to bring us to the truth. Sifting of wheat, spiritual, from the chaff reveals our weaknesses, which I've already shared with you. Sifting is designed to shake our faith. And hopefully, the enemy is hoping that in the end, we will declare with our fists our opposition to the very God that saved us. It is a, a tremendous battle depending on the depth of what we perceive is the offense from God. It's a tremendous battle. And people have battled that, that fight and have won. I'm called to mind uh, when um, Saul uh, was in a fight with the Philistines and uh, they had a champion called Goliath on, on their side. And nobody, everybody was afraid of Goliath. Everybody is afraid of the enemy. Everybody is afraid of Satan. And David, who was a little boy at the time, uh, heard that someone was troubling the people of God. And so when he came on the scene and challenged this devil, this Satan, this Goliath, this huge hunk of a man, he laughed at him. He said, no way. They send you to me? But he said, I come against you in the name of my God. And that's our position when we're going through whatever we're going through for God to establish and highlight our weaknesses that the truth might be realized. We come against the enemy in the name of the Lord. We come against the enemy by faith that God who started this work in me, is well able to finish it. When I got saved, I never told God that I could do it. Quite to the contrary. In the beginning, I doubted if he could. But he convinced me over time that he was well able to finish this work that he started in me and in you. So, this sifting like wheat in Judges 6 verse 11 through 13. Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth tree, which was in Ophrah, which belonged to Joash the Abizarite, while his son Gideon threshed wheat in the winepress. In so he's threshing wheat, but God is getting ready to sift uh, some things in Gideon's life. Continue. In order to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, the Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. Gideon said to him, O oh my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? See, that's it. why is all this happening to us if the Lord is with us? So that was his position. Why, why is this going on? Continue. And where are all his miracles, which our fathers told us about? So what happened to all the miracles? You remember when he used to do miracle after miracle? I mean, what are you doing? There's a stalemate here. You don't do miracles anymore? Continue. Saying, did not the Lord bring us up from his Egypt, from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. So when we're going through, when we're being tested by the enemy, when we're being tested by life, we're being tested by our circumstances, our attitude of heart initially is, where are you? Why is this happening? I thought you were supposed to be with us. What happened to your good name? Everybody's got going to know that I have trials in my life just like other people. And Lord, that can't be good <laughs> because the other people are denying you. 
And I'm the one that's for you. How is it that I'm having the same trials and tribulations and temptations and the enemy is after me like that? Something is not right about this. Something is not fair. And that's our attitude of heart until we get converted. <laughs> that we understand no matter what God is with us. It's a, it's a lifelong experience. It's not something that you learn and that's the end of it. It continues on and on. And the enemy hopes that we are wore out. It, it, there's a scripture in Revelation that says during the tribulation, they wore out the saints. So that whole weary, just getting weary from battling the forces of life. And sometimes Satan himself as the young people might say, it's a lot. In June 7, I mean, I'm sorry, June, Judges 7, verse 4 through 5. So God has to teach him now need to thresh. I'm talking about Gillian wheat, but this is just one example, and I'm going past the fact. But the thresh, the, the, uh, the, 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 uh, let's read, and then I'll get it. <laughs> Judges 7, 4 to 5. But the Lord said to Gideon, the people are still too many. Bring them down to the water and I will test them for you there. He had to thresh or sift experiences. He had to learn through the process of sifting to know what to look for, what not to look for, how to, um, how to uh, if you will, disciple wisdom and strategy and those kinds of things continue. Then it will be that of whom I say to you, this one shall go with you. The same shall go with you. He said, there's too many. Continue. And of, whom, and of whomever I say to you, this one shall not go with you. The same shall not go. So he brought the people down to the water. And the Lord said to Gideon, everyone who laps from the water with his tongue as a dog laps, you shall set apart by himself. Likewise, everyone who gets down on his knees to drink. So the whole idea is he, had this, he was threshing wheat, but he was going to learn to thresh or sift the understanding of how to proceed in his attack against their enemies. So God will bring us through these experiences so he can show us who's on the Lord's side, who is standing with you. And he will also show you the tears that are in your mess. People that say they for you, but they are not for you. In fact, they work for the very tester that's testing you. And uh, First Chronicles 21, starting with verse 1. Now Satan stood up against Israel and moved David to number Israel. So he moved David. Here it is, a man after God's own heart. He was doing something that even his uh, general told him, you can't do that. God will not accept that. God told you not to do that, and you're doing it anyway. He's getting ready to get sifted, this David. Continue. So David said to Joab and to the leaders of the people, Go number Israel from Beersheba to Dan, and bring the number of them to me, that I may know it. And Joab answered, May the Lord make his people a hundred times more than they are. But my, lords, but my lord the king, are they not all my lord's servants? Why then does my Lord require this thing? Why should he be a cause of guilt in Israel? Nevertheless, the king's word prevailed against Joab. So he numbered the people. And so God sent Gad the prophet to speak to him in verse 11. No, let's go uh, verse 9. Then the Lord spoke to Gad, David's seer, saying, Go and tell David, saying, Thus says the Lord, I offer you three things. Choose one of them for yourself, that I may do it to you. So Gad came to David and said to him, Thus says the Lord, Choose for yourself. And verse 13. And David said to Gad, I am in great distress. Please let me fall into the hand of the Lord, for his mercies are very great. But do not let me fall into the hand of men. So he had to sift him. So the motive of his heart to disobey God, knowing he was disobeying. So David was not the saint that we like to think he was. He was human and he did wrong things. And God had to send the enemy 
to test him and to stir him up and move him because he could be moved. It is of the Lord's mercy that we are not consumed because his compassion felleth not. Any of us can be moved against God. It's his mercy. And, and this scripture is going to go on, the initial one I started out with. And I'm going to tell you why that we don't do even worse things or that the thing that we're doing it is not our undoing because somebody is praying for us night and day that we don't fail. That's why we can go to this intercessor. And so David, you can read the story for yourself because I have to move on about how he repented because that conversion led to him confessing and repenting again. And he would have other episodes in his life where the enemy would move him or the, his desire of his heart, that of his flesh, would move him against God. And all of those things in life, God will come and sift us uh, like wheat. And um, 1 John, you can go back to Luke 22 just to read the part that I prayed for you. But I have prayed for you. So he told Peter... Jesus speaking to preach, I have prayed for you. In 1 John 2, verse 1 through 2. My little children, these things I write to you, so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. So he is our advocate. So here it is, the enemy standing, accusing us before God the Father night and day. And Jesus is on the other side, telling God that he will finish the work by his spirit in us that he started. And God, the Father, has a confidence in Jesus because Jesus always obeyed him. So he said, this trial is set for another day because <laughs> it's not over. <laughs> I, can't, I can't rule over it because I have somebody praying for Peter. That he does not fail, even though he failed. Strike, it doesn't even come. You know how they have to examine the, the evidence before they can bring it to court. And both sides have to agree that whether the evidence is going to be presented. But the father has the ruling voice. He said that evidence is not going to come to court. The fact that he failed. <laughs> so he didn't want to come to court. Because I see blood, your blood, covering them. That's the way it goes. The devil, he could accuse night and day. He's, he, it'll never happen as long as Jesus is praying that we're beseeching the Lord night and day. That we're crying out to God, save me from myself. Save me. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25. Therefore, he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. He's living to make intercession for me when the enemy comes to sift me like we. He's living to make, to make sure that even though I fail, I don't fail. <laughs> I mean, my God is something. Luke 22, he, I have prayed for you that what your faith does not fail, that your faith won't be broken in the midst of the trial, the tribulation, in the midst of the assault of the tester. Your faith will remain strong in me. He that started the work is well able to finish. I'm able to save to the uttermost. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 through 9. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that, and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation. We are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. It's going to be the last time, one day, for all of us. It's going to be the last time. The last time we are, if you will, fraught with diverse trials and tribulations. It's going to be a getting up morning, that morning, because it's going to be the last morning. Thank God. Continue. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. There is a conversion, and that conversion causes us to return and Almost all the time, when you go through something like this, that he went through, something similar, something tragic, something terrible. Once that conversion happened, you, you, my mind is made up. You go back to God, never to leave him again. In the case of um, David, he never sinned against God again after Psalm 51. As first, I understand. Job, I'm sure if he was self-righteous before, it did, not ever again. He said, because I have seen you now with my own eyes. I've heard of you before, but now there was a conversion that I can see you. The Bible said Moses endured seeing the invisible God because these experiences cause you to see him as he is. He is an awesome God. He is a God that cannot fail and he will not fail to us. So it said, your faith does not fail that when you return to me or when you are converted in Psalms 90 verse 3. You turn man to destruction and say, return, O children of men. 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 25. For you were like sheep going astray, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Return to me. That's what the Lord was telling Peter. He said, your faith, I'm praying that your faith don't fail. And, and when, it, when it's all over, come back to me. Return to me. Convert. Stay with me. No matter what's going on, don't leave me. No matter how it hurt, no matter how painful it is, no matter how sad it is, how grieved you are, how disappointed you are, don't leave me. And when you don't leave me and you stay with me, I have a job, I have a call on your life. I have a, a position or purpose for you to undertake, strengthen your brethren. When you see them going away because of the pain, because of the sorrow, the disappointment, the hurt, I need you to go to them and tell them how you got over. I need for you to share your experience that even after all you did and the rooster crowed, the Lord looked at you and you saw that he still loved you. You saw that he still believed in you. And you wept. You howled bitterly. And you thought you would never see him again. That he would never come back and ask you to do anything. But he did one day. You saw him on the shoreline. And he had got fish, made breakfast. He set you down because he told you that 
He was praying for you. He said, Peter, do you love me? Do this. Peter, do you love me? Do this. Peter, do you love me? You know all things, God. You know I can't stand unless you hold me up. You know this, and I know this now. See, I've been converted. Understand the sword won't do it. Understand that if I do miracles, that won't do it. It won't keep me. I can heal somebody, but who's going to heal me? Strengthen your brethren. Galatians 6, 1 through 4. Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one examine his own work, and then he will have rejoicing in himself alone, and not in another. For each one shall bear his own load. Strengthen your brethren. You know, no longer will you judge and criticize and analyze other people's walk, other people's handling of their particular situation. Because now you've been converted. You know now. You know the sufferings that can bring you down. You know the depression that can cover your mind. You know now, Peter. Strengthen your brethren. In Romans 14, 1 through 4. Who are you to judge another's servant? To his own master he stands or falls. Indeed, he will be made to stand, for God is able to make him stand. One person esteems one day above another, another esteems every day alike. Let each be fully convinced in his own mind. Who are you? Who am I? Because God is able to make the person that you think won't make it. God is able to turn them around. So that's why you have to pray like Jesus prayed. That his faith or that person's faith won't fail. Because God is able to make him stand. In 1 Corinthians 2.16 or who has known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. We can have the mind of Christ. The mind of Christ is always redemptive. It's always praying for those that we think. Giving up on them. Forget about them. They did too wrong. They did too bad. They are this way or that way. Let me tell you something. God never gives up until the last time. If they're still above surface and haven't gone home, there's an opportunity for God to turn them back to himself. Father, we thank you. We bless you. We honor you. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen.